wonderful. So yeah, I'm Kitty and I'm from RSPB. Um, and thank you so much for coming tonight. It's really, um, yeah, this my role was really meant to be about seeing a lot of people and, and sharing my enthusiasm of SWIFTS. Um, and I was worried that would be taken away. So it's really wonderful to be in this really strange situation of being able to talk to people through a screen. Um, and I'll pass over to Callie to introduce herself. Hi everybody, I'm Callie from the Huntley and District Swift Group. Um, I have a little bit of an introduction. Shall I do that now, Katie? Or I'll go through just the agenda. Yeah, what we're going to do. Yeah, 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 lovely. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. So, let's see, it might not be up to speed. So I'll just introduce what we'll be talking about this evening. Um, both of our projects, the wonderful Swift Bird, and um, their unfortunate decline, but what we can do about it both at home and in our church community with a specific focus on the nest boxes because we're in winter. And then at the end, um, signposting and questions. So there might be quite a lot of information in the um, PowerPoint, but I will be um, sending a follow-up email after to all attendees. So don't worry too much about getting all the details. Just enjoy. <laughs> um, so I'll just say about my project. Um, RSPB, if you've not heard of it, it's the um, largest conservation organisation in the UK. Um, the, my specific project is funded by the Scottish Power Foundation and it is to uh, turn Edinburgh into a swift sanctuary. Um, because of COVID, I've got more scope to kind of go beyond that and support people beyond that. Um, but the main focus is Edinburgh for me. Um, and yeah, I'm set up to do a lot of surveys in the summer and um, to contribute to scientific research looking into foraging behaviour of the swift and um, to better understand the bird and how best we can conserve and protect them. Um, but yeah, overall to protect and enhance the population that's already in Edinburgh. Um, and that is done through urban conservation, but also with community education and raising awareness. So I'll pass on to Callie to introduce her project. Hi, thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, I apologise, I've got some notes in front of me here, um, but uh, just forgive me for that. Um, yeah, I started the SWIFT group in 2017. We're now just a small group of local uh, volunteers raising awareness of the common SWIFT, um, basically around the northeast of Scotland. Uh, we cover Aberdeenshire, Aberdeen and Murrayshire. Uh, we offer SWIFT presentations to groups and schools. We fundraise at local shows and events. We organise swift watching evenings. Uh, we also have an annual community nest box scheme. Um, and we do surveying for swifts, of course, for their nest sites every season. The swift sightings we gather are of great importance to swift conservation. And we lodge our records with both um, our local authority and with the RSPB swift mapper, which I think Katie's gonna tell you a little bit more about later. Um, much of my time is spent liaising with the local council environmental planners regarding planning applications and how best to provide um, swift nesting places with swift bricks and to um, protect existing sites that we've um, uh, recorded. In addition to the work of the RSPB and ourselves, there are two other extremely active um, swift groups in Scotland and they are Concern for Swifts and they're based in Glasgow and there's Tayside Swifts as well. There's also a national SWIFT uh, local network which connects SWIFT groups across the UK. Um, I think there's about, well, probably over 60 SWIFT groups in the UK, which is fantastic to know. Um, and they can all uh, blog and message each other and, and help each other out. Providing for SWIFTs within church buildings is something I'm very keen to do. And I'm very pleased to be given this opportunity um, this evening to be involved with that. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Callie. Um, and finally, um, people working together for SWIFTS is hopefully your church community. Um, the Creating a Home for SWIFTS can be part of the Eco, Eco Congregations Award um, and also part of the Faith in Nature project, which gives different examples of how you can help nature um, specific to each season. So we'll be aligning with that a little bit as well. Um, and the reason that I put it out like this is just to show that on many levels, there's people caring about SWIFTS and that's what we need. We need people on many different levels all working together. Um, so there's no such thing as you're too small to make a difference. So onto the SWIFT. So unfortunately, this is what comes up whenever you Google, what is a SWIFT? Um, but obviously that's not what I'm here for tonight. I'm here to talk about the real SWIFT, which is one of these three birds. 
Um, and the other two birds beside the swift are um, commonly misconceptive of the swift. Um, so I wonder if I'll give you 20 seconds just now to see if you can work out which one's a swift. Um, and extra points if you know the other birds and gold stars if you know the Latin names for the mm -hmm. birds as well. And don't worry, I'm not going to quiz anybody. I'm just giving you time to think about it for yourself. Okay, drum roll. <laughs> this is our swift. This is our swift that comes to Scotland. Um, its Latin name is Apis Apis, which Kelly's going to tell us what it means. Um, I'm a bit of an etymology geek and really love to understand the Latin, but um, Kelly's going to explain what it, what it is, the translation of it. The other birds are the swallow and the house martin. And I just wanted to share how I remember the difference between them because they are very similar looking in the sky. So I think about the um, Victorian era tail coat that's often also called swallow tails. And I also think about the very topical white house. So the house martin has got a white belly and that's the one that looks very like a swift in the sky, but you can sometimes see the difference of color of the belly. So I think white house if I see a white belly. But our swift looks like this. My neighbor described it as an anchor shape and that's how they look in the sky, which I find very useful myself. Um, it's got crescent shaped wings, it is black as I said, with a little white, the babies have a little white chin um, and a short forked tail. So why are the swifts so interesting? Well me and Callie wanted to share our um, passion for swifts through a little very cute picture but also Callie paints really wonderful pictures of the swift and I've got a little poem that I wrote about the swift that I wanted to share. So Butterflies are fluttering, bluebells unfurling, but the true sign of summer is a little swift unfurling, is a little swift returning. She's travelled here over 3,000 miles, up to 70 miles per hour and facing endless trials, opportunistically feeding at 50 metres high, storing a bolus of a thousand insects for when rations run dry. A life on the wing means 10 months in the sky and two months to rest. She used to land in sea cliffs and hollow trees, but there she can no longer rest. Into buildings she went, and that would indeed do. But now, with thermal insulation, that's gone too. In two decades, numbers went down by 50%, an amber-listed species that we cannot allow to be further spent. But then we remember that in cultures past, the little swift was a sign of hope that would last. You can help by giving nature a home and making Scotland a swift sanctuary where they'll be free to roam. That was a little bit of enthusiasm about the swift between me and Callie. <laughs> and I'll pass over to you now, Callie, for you to talk about the wonderful bird in more detail. Thanks very much, Katie. I love that poem. It's really lovely. Um, right, okay, so yeah, um, I've got about, um, I'm not sure, is it six slides, something like that, just to, um, to for you to see. And I'll just try and explain um, a little bit about the Swifts for those who perhaps don't know them so well um, and explain just, um, you know, what they get up to and, and uh, the, the name and, the, you know, all the stuff that we've got to go with them. So the first slide is just showing um, a couple of pictures of the Swift, a couple of close-ups. Um, a Swift's body length is around six inches, so it's not very big. Uh, its wingspan is about 15 inches. It's a rich sooty brown colour, although it looks black against the sky. Uh, and only the young birds have a white uh, patch under their chin. They have a short forked tail and large deep seated eyes, which you can see here quite clearly. They have a, a row of bristles across the top of the eyes, which keeps out the debris um, at high speed and, uh, and reduces glare as well. The average lifespan is around five or six years. The scientific name for common swift, Apus Apus, is from the Greek, which means without foot. Well, they obviously have feet, um, but possibly this made some reference to their short, weak legs. However, its feet are amazingly powerful with four strong forward-facing claws, uh, enabling the bird to cling to vertical surfaces while looking for nest sites. 
Swifts are true aviators and are built for speed. Their aerial agility is second to none. They can reach speeds of 70 mile an hour and spend more time airborne than any other species and only ever land for a few uh, months just to raise their family. Uh, next, Katie. Thank you. There's over 100 different species of swift across the globe, but in this slide you'll see the breeding and wintering ranges of the common swift. They overwinter in sub-Saharan Africa and breed as far south as the northern tip of Africa, across much of Europe, China and even sub-Arctic Russia. Common swift are absent in polar regions in southern Chile, New Zealand and most of Australia. Thanks, Katie. The migration route is something to behold. The swifts arrive in Scotland in early May, leaving again around the end of August, although we've had some staying into September this year. They arrive later than the swallows and the house martins and they leave earlier, so they're here just for a short time. Estimations vary greatly as to the length of their migration, but uh, a round trip is thought to be anywhere between 12,000 and 17,000 miles. They'll all take maybe different routes uh, on the way. In 2010, the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology, fitted nine swifts with geolocators, which you can see here on the left, um, and released them from Falmere Nature Reserve in Cambridge. This is the journey of one swift known as A320, <laughs> which isn't a very endearing name, but there we are, A320. On leaving the UK, if you look at the map here, on leaving the UK, it flew um, south through France and Spain, down the west coast of Africa, crossing the Sahara and turning inland at Senegal. It then travelled across country, arriving at its destination in the rainforest of the Congo. Whilst in the wintering grounds, the swifts can cover great distances from Angola uh, to Mozambique, Nigeria, down to South Africa. They, uh, they don't stop. The northerly return journey for Swift A320 was very different indeed. It left the Congo, it flew west to Angola, it took three days to cross the Atlantic and spent 10 days in the skies over Liberia, feeding up for the speedy return journey um, towards Algeria and on through Europe. Remarkably, a one-way journey can be completed in less than a month. And of course, most migratory birds that we know of will make many food stops en route, but the swift, which feeds on the wing, um, completes its entire journey non-stop. So I think that's a really good reason to give them a home when they get here, because <laughs> they must be exhausted. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Swifts are loyal to one nesting site their entire breeding life. They are thought to favour tall old buildings but are often found in a variety of builds and heights um, there's certainly known I've known swifts uh, having nests at um, a height of three feet off the ground so um, uh, sorry three meters off the ground that would be just three meters off the ground so they can actually um, contrary to what we say that they can they can nest quite low down they access their nest site under gutters as you can see here under gutters through holes in the pointing um, they have hole, if it's a hole in a soffit or a fascia board, they'll get into that. Uh, holes in walls as well, under loose tiles and slates, um, and often in a small hole behind uh, a downpipe. That's a favourite of theirs as well. They'll enter these sites at around 40 miles an hour and they'll break at the last minute just to land uh, inside the, on the wall head, and that's where they'll make their nest. They don't add very much to their nest. It's really just a poor thing. They'll just uh, collect a few things uh, in flight, a few feathers, uh, maybe a moth or two, something like that, and lay that down and, and that's, that's their nest. Due to their long wings and their short legs, they're unable to enter the building or any, have any further access into the roof space. Um, if you've ever seen a Swift cam video of a Swift inside its nest box, you'll notice that the, uh, the adults can only um, wander around on their bellies. They, they, their little legs are useless and their long wings um, are pretty hopeless inside a box as well. So they just wander around on their belly. They're very clean and they're very quiet birds and most people aren't even aware that they're there. Thanks, Katie. Swifts with their huge gaping mouth that you can see here, they catch hundreds of flying insects and airborne spiders whilst on the wing. 
They catch a variety of different insects at varying altitudes, such as spiders, beetles, gnats, moths, aphids, mosquitoes, and many more. So they have a really a varied diet. The insects are mixed with saliva and stored as a bolus in a chin pouch and then taken to the, uh, the chicks to, to feed. And you can see the one on the left there is just, he's just breaking as he enters into his nest site there with a, with a bolus full of food for the chicks. Swifts can travel hundreds of miles in one day searching for foods at, time, um, at times of scarcity. We even know that they gather in huge groups and head down the east coast of the UK to cross over the North Sea or the English Channel on foraging trips. So how do the chicks and the nest survive for so long whilst the adults are away? Well, firstly, the eggs can survive chilling at any stage of development. Of course, this can extend the incubation period for a, over several days. Uh, both adults and chicks can enter um, a state of torpor for two or three days. So they reduce their metabolic rate and live off their fat reserves um, if the food is scarce. And I think that and maybe somebody else will know this, but I think house martins can actually enter a state of torpor as well, I've heard. And for refreshment, the swifts will catch raindrops en route and fly low over water courses and scoop up the water as they go along. Thanks, Katie. Slip, uh, swifts can do most everything on the wing and that includes sleeping. The adult breeding birds will spend each night in the nest site tending to the chicks. It's the only time they can take advantage of a good sleep in a full year. The non-breeders and juveniles will ascend to around 10,000 feet and remain there during the night, almost in a state of free fall. They will enter a semi-conscious state known as unihemispherical slow wave sleep, where they basically switch off alternate sides of the brain. You could say sleeping with one eye open. This enables them to stay on course during the, during the night and be aware of any predators that are around them. Thanks, Katie. Uh, since swifts do everything else on the wing, they also mate on the wing as well as at the nest site. Not much more I can say about that, really. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. <laughs> swifts pair for life. They find their mate in the first juvenile year. They meet at the nest site each year, ready to share all the parental duties, and they are doting parents. They lay up to three white eggs, and the young swiftlets are fed to a heavy weight of 50 grams before fledging. At four weeks of age, the young will begin press-ups on their wingtips to strengthen them, ready for their migration journey and a life of continuous flight. They will leave the nest at around six weeks of age, generally heading straight off for Africa. Unlike swallow, swallows and house martins, they don't tend to gather in groups before leaving and the parent birds most often leave about a week later. From leaving the nest, these young birds won't land again for another three years and until they are ready to breed for themselves. As a yearling, well, they will return and join up with another uh, swift colony, a bit like teenagers going out and finding a group of pals, that's what they'll do when they're a year old. In their second year, they'll begin to prospect for a nest site uh, to raise their own family in the following year. You may have heard of a screaming party. This is when young prospecting swifts and established breeders communicate to each other. The adults will call from within the nest site and encourage the younger birds to come and join the colony. It's easy to see the importance of protecting existing active nest sites as the established breeding birds are the key to attracting the uh, new pairs to the area and so maintaining the swift colony. Once you lose an active nest site, it will be very difficult to encourage the birds to come back. And sadly, this is one of the reasons for their decline. And I hope you've uh, learned something there. That's, that's me done, Katie. <laughs> Thank you very much, Callie. You're welcome. Um, well, I hope at I hope at this point the swift has stolen your heart like it has for us. I think just this picture alone kind of grabs my heart as it is. Um so moving on to what's happening now and why we are wanting to speak with people about the swift. So in the space of 20 years it was recorded that uh the swift population declined by 50%. This um this is actually closer to 60% now. 
Um, so despite the fact that the Swift evolved whenever the Tyrannosaurus Rex died out um, 60 million years ago, it is declining um, and almost two thirds of its populations are gone in the past 30 years. Um, and this is why they've been regarded as amber conservation status. Um, so very close to, to red, um, which means endangered. And this is also why then they've been an RSPB priority species since 2009. Um, and why is this? Well, the scientific reason um, has not been specifically proven, but we've got a few ideas. So as you'll know yourself from driving in the past 20 years, there used to be lots of bugs splat onto the window screen. Um, and now you, know, you don't see them anymore. Um, and that's just the stark contrast of how impacted the insect population has been in the past 20 and 30 years. Um, and we also know as well, uh, yeah, and the swift eats the insects as we've talked about. We also know as well that just from this summer even, Scotland reached a drought level um, of lack of water and rain. Um, so there's a lot more freak weather conditions happening, a lot of freak, um, more frequent extreme weather conditions such as storms. This can disrupt the migration path of the swift. Um, and just this year, it was a different species of swift, but um, they got blown off their course across the Mediterranean Sea and ended up getting blown onto Greek islands and um, very, very, very weak. And a lot of them unfortunately died. Um, what we do know is that there's a decrease in the habitat availability. So as Kelly was saying, they nest underneath the eaves of buildings. Um, and for a number of reasons, um, those places of nesting have decreased. Um, and so this can be a really unfortunate side effect of uh, renovating a roof or insulating a roof, um, which is obviously really good for the environment, but also can result in the swift nest being lost. Also roof repairs. Um, fortunately, we're working with a UK wide um, roofing network to educate and spread awareness about the swifts. And there's already positive case studies about um, roofers working with the swifts and the end result being the swift, the roof being repaired and the swift nest being preserved. So there is a way. Um, another decline as a result of new builds not yet providing the swift nest boxes or bricks. Um, in Edinburgh Council, it's suggested that the swift bricks go into new developments, which is really brilliant. Um, and we're also working with Barrett's to uh, include the Swift Nest's bricks into their new development homes as well. Um, another reason for decline in the urban environment is buildings being demolished without their being, without people realizing that there's Swift Nest there. So all very doom and gloom, but here's a lovely rainbow to cheer us up. And as well as that, I'm gonna now talk about what we can do, um, both how we can help um, in our homes, but also in our church community. So aligning with the Faith Action for Nature project, I've divided it into what we can do for each season. And the great thing is, is that there's things to do every season um, and we can do them on different levels as well. So in the spring, we can sow wildflower meadows um, and this obviously then gives insects a home and increases the insect population. In the summer, we can do the surveys that Callie mentioned um, and upload the information on the SWIFT mapper, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. In the autumn, we can also um, plant more wildflower meadows um, for the insect population. And in the winter, which is what I'm focusing on today, what we're focusing on today is to make a nest and also to plant trees. So the oak tree, for example, that supports, supports um, 3,000 different species of insect on it every year, a mature oak tree. Um, so that's a really good example of how trees can support the insect population and then the swifts as well. The whole way throughout the year, there's two things we can do. And that one of them is to steward a nest. So to be aware using Swift Mapper, um, which is an online map about where there are nests all over the UK. So you can log on to swiftmapper.org.uk and see the locations of Swift Maps, of Swift nests. Um, if you're were to become aware of where there's a swift nest in your local area, you can be the guardian of that in a way. So you would just check it every so often and see if there might be roof repair going on or anything like that and just speak to the people there and ask them to maybe consider the swift nest. Um, doing things like that can honestly, like saving just one swift nest can 
cause such an impact into the population that it would really help. As well as that, being aware of climate change and what behaviours we can do in our daily lives to um, mitigate the impacts of a changing world. So just in picture form, wildflower meadows, um, swift mapper and doing surveys in the summer, taking action for climate change and planting trees. Now is a really good time in winter from November until January or February. Maybe even March is um, a good time to plant trees, particularly the oak tree, as I've got pictured here. So in the winter, um, we can make nest boxes both at home and in the church. There's, again, there's going to be a bit, a bit of information here, but there will be resources sent out. So sorry if it's a bit overwhelming. And um, on the top left, this is a pre-made nest box. On the top right, this is the SoFit design, which is a long plank of wood that's parallel to the eaves of buildings, and it's partitioned into lots of different nest boxes for the Swifts. And um, the bottom left is lots of Swift nest boxes built into the gables of homes. So the actual boxes are in the loft on the inside. And um, on the bottom right are these Swift bricks that were created for new developments. Um, they can sometimes be retrospectively fitted, but just say you were getting an extension or something, it's good to know about the Swift nest boxes as well. So how you would go about doing at home, get a team together, whether it's your family, um, whoever else you live with, um, or your neighbours. Uh, find a suitable location, both ecologically and practically. So some of the conditions for putting up a nest box are to be 4.5 metres high, and that's because of their, their wee feet. They, um, they normally um, kind of let themselves out of the nest box and drop a little bit and then start flying so they don't have strong feet to push themselves off. And then a northeast, northwest facing wall, and that's to not overheat in the sun and no obstructions such as trees um, because the trees can support little predators to sit on the, sit there and then, yeah, attack the swifts. Um, obviously ask permission from the homeowner if it's not you and um, to consider the costs. So um, I have funding for Edinburgh so I can help some churches in Edinburgh but I'm not allowed to use my funding beyond that. Um, if you buy a pre-made nest box it can cost between 30 and 40 pounds but just last week I made one myself um, and this was out of um, upcycled plywood and I bought some screws and I used a saw and um, a measuring tape. So if you know of any woodworking groups in your area who would want to do that or if you wanted to try it yourself, there's a resource online on the RSPB website of how you can go about making that. Um, and then another thing you want to think about in terms of cost is how accessible is the location of your Swift Nest box. So hopefully you could access it by a ladder and do that yourself or get somebody to do that. Otherwise, if it's on like a five story building, as many buildings are in Edinburgh, um, you'd need a roofer to do that. And that will obviously impact the cost quite a lot. But again, we're working with a roofing network to try and create a list of um, suitable people who are able to do that. And it all sounds like a lot of work, but in the end, look at this beautiful swift in its, in its wee nest. So for the church group, finally got around to talking about this, um, there's two possibilities of putting the nest boxes in. Um, you can build a nest box specifically for the louvres of your church um, in the Belfry. And there's many examples of this, but here's two of them, one in Suffolk and one in uh, Sandton Downham. Um, and those are basically just, yeah, as you can see, the boxes partitioned into different nest boxes and they're just put against um, the inside of the louvres and that allows access for the swift. Another example in Germany where they put um, a nest box behind the ventilation tiles to let the swift come in. So again at church get a team together of people that are ingested and have capacity. Find a suitable location either in the louvres in the belfry or um, behind ventilation tiles. Again keeping in mind all the other requirements I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, so ask permission I've spoken to an architect within Edinburgh who said because the nest box will either be um, the external pre-made one that can just be screwed in and um, that's removable or else the nest box will be behind the louvres which is non-intrusive to the external structure of the church then um, you don't need planning permission for it 
and um, that was his that was his thoughts as a as an architect and um, I would still recommend to check what your local requirements might be again to consider the costs as mentioned but again we end up with a happy swift at the end of it and as I said as well just protect giving a home to one family has a huge impact to the population Another example of a success story was in St. Peter's and St. Paul's community. So simply by local people knowing about the Swifts, um, they realised that whenever the church roof was being renovated, um, that there was a Swift colony there and they needed to do something about it. So they got the church council and a local architect together um, and made plans to protect the colony. And there was local heritage roofers that um, carried through the work and ensured that the old nests were retained. What they actually did was remove the old tiles, marked the nest positions between the tiles and the roofing membrane and retained um, those places whenever the stone tiles were put back on. And the resulting factor was a lot more homes available for the Swifts. And here's some pictures of it in action just here. So I think it's always nice to hear a success story that it is possible. And why are the, why are the Swifts so suitable for um, being in your church? As Kelly mentioned, the Swifts are very tidy. They actually um, take their, their droppings um, away from the nest and the parents actually eat the droppings of the babies because of the high protein content of the insects. Um, as well as that, there are the fact there's the fact that the um, swift come they're very loyal to their nests and they come back year after year um, and then their babies will come back to where they were born as well and they'll come back year after year and I was speaking to a roofer who said he had a client um, that referred to the swift as family that they would come back every year um, in the summer and they would welcome them back with great joy and here's an example on the right of um, a swift action in Harleston, where the church community came together to welcome the Swifts back in May. Um, and they made this bunting for the roofs and they hung different flags of Africa um, around to welcome the Swifts back, which I thought was really beautiful. So tips to improve success. I said I'd speak more about the Swift Mapper. So as I said, it's an online map um, where you can check where in your area are are there nests as well as that the little blue symbol are um, represents screaming parties um, and why that's important is that the swift exhibits natal nesting so as I said it goes back to where it was born to create its own nest so if the swift comes back and right beside its own nest is an empty nest then it's more likely to nest and it's a higher success rate um, and that's why we need more people doing surveys and uploading more information to the swift mapper um, but don't be down if in your area there aren't swifts because it's not 100% accurate it relies because it relies on people uploading information and if there's nobody knowing about swifts then there won't be the information online. What you can do um, in the nest box, this looks a bit scary but it's not, um, it's just a speaker that calls out the swift sounds um, which attracts swifts to come to the nest box and then nest. And what my next picture was about was um, good things take time because some nests um, don't get filled for two or three years. But then I was running through this with Callie earlier and she gave me a very lovely story, but maybe um, that could be the first question for after. So signposting and next steps. As Kelly mentioned, there are swift local groups across Scotland and there will be one in Edinburgh starting next year. There is one in Glasgow, Perth and the Huntley district and Huntley and district area. Um, I'm going to upload resources onto the Eco Congregations website in the resources, ideas for action section online. And we're also hoping to tie in with the Faith in Nature project as well, which is on, uh, has another website um, online. I'm going to follow up with an email to everybody here today with um, a pledge of how to protect SWIFTS um, with varying capacities, you know, like just one of them is like telling people about SWIFTS and another one is building nest box kind of thing. So there's a variety of options that you can do. And um, the nest box information, I can send information about that and the Swift caller, where to get that from and further website links about Swifts. Okay, 
I'm aware that was a lot of information. Um, but thank you so much for listening and um, taking the time to come today. It's really wonderful to already see the support for SWIFTS um, in turning Scotland into a sanctuary. And we'll just open the floor now if anybody's got any questions. Thank you, ladies. That was fantastic. So much information. I think my head's still burling actually after that. I see what you mean by the little legs in these pictures. I wasn't really getting that until I just saw those pictures just now. Yeah, they're a bit more like um, koala or chameleon legs. Like they kind of, they grip sideways rather than like your normal that way <laughs> of a bird, um, which is why they kind of fall over whenever they try and stand. It's really quite sweet, which is why they just fly all the time instead. <laughs> Well, can I just encourage anybody who's got questions about this, please do unmute yourself and please ask. I don't know, Kate, if you want to stop screen sharing and then we'll be able to see everybody. Yeah. Bob, should I tell my little story about the call system? I think, to... I think oh, Patricia going to ask a question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, no, 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 no. Oh, no, you weren't. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, maybe Kelly, if you want to go ahead and then people just, can just to, um, have a think about what, what they want to ask. Um, yeah, the call system, it doesn't necessarily take two or three years because I um, last year decided to, I, I live in surrounded by farmland. So I didn't think too much the Swifts would come. I had thought I'd maybe seen one a couple of years ago. But anyway, briefly, I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to put boxes up just now. I'll um, perhaps have a go at putting the call system up at my house. So um, I'm sort of two miles away from Huntley. And I chucked the, uh, put the call system out and chucked the um, speaker for the call system out the bathroom window. Um, and uh, within uh, one week, I had two Swifts checking out the sound. And that's basically, they're thinking that the sound, the call of the Swift that they're hearing means that there's somebody nesting there. So, um, so they were encouraged, like I was saying before, they were in, it, the sound was encouraging them to come and have a look and see if there was a vacant, uh, vacancy in the building so that was just one week so then a partner and I we we um said to him you know let's get the boxes up so we put two boxes up and I've got videos now of them they spent the whole summer here and um just a pair well it was three actually but there was a particular obviously a pair there um just banging up at the boxes and, and checking them out so it can ha happen within a week or two so mm -hmm. I thought I'd just <laughs> let you know that very exciting <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing actually I know, it's lovely, I can't wait for them to come back next year Can, can I just add to that? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. I, sorry, you can't see me, but um, it's just very. I have a very similar story to that. I, I live in Darlington um, in the northeast, and um, I put some nest boxes. Well, we put some nest boxes up on the gable end of our house um, just last year, and they came. The, the Swifts returned on the seventh of May. That, that's the first day I saw them. So we did a very similar thing. We hung the um, speaker out of our bathroom window. We've got quite a high gable end. We've got like a three-story house, and mm -hmm. they literally the next morning they were flying up. And actually, bizarrely, I ran down because I was aware of them flying up towards it. I ran down to the outside of the house, and one actually we had it sitting on the windowsill, and one flew in to the bathroom. <laughs> Itself. honestly I couldn't believe my eyes and I had to run up two flights of stairs and I had to really gently it wasn't injured thankfully I was so you know so worried that it might be injured but I had to really gently lift it out of the window and it was fine and so from then we then actually hung it underneath the we put a little hook under the nest box I never dreamed for a minute um it would but they kept coming there was three of them two in particular but a little party of three and they were flying up at it and flying up at it and looking at in the hole and didn't go in for ages and I just thought oh, they're not, you know they, they would and actually they would go sorry I'm waffling on but they would go we had um we had a box sort of lower than the actual apex and they were flying up at the apex so we put an additional box up at the apex and then would you believe a couple of weeks later after lots of interest they went into the box and they mm. they roosted I know the first year they roosted overnight for the rest of the year so I'm so excited for next year thinking you know if they might if they do manage to get back but just as to demonstrate how effective they really react to the to the calls you know if people oh. are able to do that Fantastic. and I know some people can take years to I would say you know I know some people can don't be despondent I guess I guess I think we've just been incredibly lucky I think some people 
um, I don't know if you're aware of uh, Mark Glanville down at Bristol Swift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He, ha he has a lot, of, a lot of boxes on his house, doesn't he, Ruth? He does, he does, but yes. it took him quite a few years to, I think it was about five or six years before he got some interest and now he's got a really mm -hmm. well-established colony. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much, Ruth. Ready to ask a question, Claire? Yes. Um, we used to see, I live in Liberton in Edinburgh. Brilliant. And, and we used to see Swiss flying um, over the garden, you know, high up above the garden, but I haven't seen them for a while. I just wondered, um, on the mapping thing, are, are there Swifts in Liberton? I'm not sure, actually. Um, I'd need to check, but I can send you the link for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then to go on to the, the website. It's, it's as easy, it's, um, it's like using Google Maps, it's quite mm -hmm. easy. But I can also check it and send it to you as well if you'd like to. No, I'll I'll, I'll check myself. I thought you might know. I thought you might have the information. Yeah, I know. I've spent a lot of time looking at the map, but I, <laughs> I've not retained all the information about it. I've seen lots of Swifts in Edinburgh around Arthur's Seat uh, uh, this year, and sort of wondered, what, you know, whether they actually nest around here. I, I, but I, I, I don't know. I've never really looked for uh, swift nest boxes, so I don't know. I'd be mm -hmm. very interested to find out. Yeah, from from memory, I remember around Arthur's Seat a bit better, but there were some along. Um, like South Clark Street and then down towards Abbey Hill and stuff as well. Um, and that's probably because there's uh, um, the two locks around Arthur's Seat and they can often feed above the locks because there's a lot of insects there. Mm. George has got a question. Yeah, George and then Bill as well. Hi, uh, I've got a bit of an ethical question. Uh, for years, we've had uh, natural uh, swift boxes, or well, they're not really boxes, they're areas underneath the eaves. I live in a, the top flat of a tenement. Mm. And um, then I realized that they weren't coming back. And it wasn't due to lack of uh, insects or, or I ideal nesting site, because it's a, a, a north east face. You know, so it, it couldn't be better and it's out of the wind. Uh, but the problem is this, be because they don't overwinter, the nesting sites always get taken over by sparrows, house sparrows. <laughs> and, you know, so the ethical problem is this, you know, if you want to encourage swifts, it, it, do, the, do the nesting boxes, make it unattractive to other species, to the swift nesting boxes, make it unattractive to other species. Yeah, exactly, they do. A lot of them are pr prom promoted that the sparrow will use it first and then the swift will use it second because they're supposed to breed at different times, but a lot of a lot of timings are off with nature right now in general, um, so there might be a bit of an overlap. Um, but the nest boxes, because they don't have a little perch beside them, um, a lot of uh, birds need the little perch before going into the nest box, but the swift nest box doesn't have that little perch. So it, well, it is supposed to I... exclude them. But Callie, do you want to add to that? Sorry. Could I? Yeah. And yeah, yeah, no, they just hang on to the wall, though. Yeah, they do, you know, George. They're, yeah. They're so agile. Most, yeah, that's right. Most, well, no, no, most, that's the wrong word, but um, an awful lot of swift nest boxes and nest spaces get used by sparrows um, especially nest spaces will get used also by starlings as well quite often because they're big enough to let a starling get in um, swift natural sites can let any kind of birds of that size in um, it's not right Katie but the boxes uh, if it's an external box you've got to always remember the difference between an external nest box and an uh, internal if you like uh, natural nesting space where they're going, which is what you're talking about. But um, yeah, the sparrows will get in um, without doubt. But the nesting boxes, the external ones, just by the by, they have um, such a whole size that doesn't let starlings in, but the sparrows do go in. And they fill it full of nesting material as well, which actually can be quite, I think, quite dangerous. Well, not dangerous, but difficult for the swifts. Um, they can get tangled up in it somehow. But um, yeah, there's, there's difficulties with that. But there's nothing much you can do about it, to be honest, I don't mm. think really. 
I know with external boxes, a lot of people will actually block off the entrance hole until they see the first Swift arrive and then they unblock it and then the Swifts can hopefully get in. And I also know that, I think that uh, people say, once the Swift has, has if you like, um, called the nest box his own, when he comes back, if something else is in there, there's quite a, there can be quite a rumpus to get the other person, that person, <laughs> the other bird out. <laughs> so, so, so there's a lot of, um, you know, pros and cons to the whole thing. And there isn't really an answer to it. I don't think, uh, Katie, is there really, I think that, I think the, um, most people just assume that, well, you know, if you're giving something a home, then you're giving something a home. I think that's often the way people think, um, about it. It's not really got anything, I don't think, either to do with the um, the side that of the uh, of the building that the nest is on. Because another thing to remember as well is if you were putting up an external box, you need to think of that um, northeast, northwest side um, being one being better than the other. Um, remember that if it's um, an internal site, a natural um, hole in the wall under the gutters, what have you, it tends to not matter which aspect it, you know, if it, because it's inside the building, you'll find swifts inter nesting internally on a building on any aspect as well, because the, the, they won't overheat, you know, so it doesn't really matter. So there's a big, there's a difference between that as well. But going back to your original question, not a lot you can do about sparrows sometimes going in, I have to say. Perhaps the answer is to have just so many of them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, something for yeah, everybody. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. yeah. Okay. And Thank you. Susan's added something and everyone feel free to add anything if you if you feel like but um Susan's give a really good recommendation of putting up sparrow nest boxes as well in hope that they might choose those nest boxes over the swift ones. But yeah, every home helps. <laughs> Bill, we have, have to ask a question. Hello. Hello. Hi. A uh, question for each of you, please. Um, in your slides, Katie, you've used the phrase faith in nature. Um, yeah. Is that one in the same <clears throat> as faith action for nature, which is one of the drop down things on the Eco Congregation website? Yes, it is. Yes. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah, I Fa think. Fan. Were... Yeah. Um, Right, a uh, and Callie. Um, yes, I'm from Aberdeen, and I come across you a few times. Oh dear, that years. doesn't sound very good. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, at our church, we have got three nest boxes up with the assistance of ab sailors and everything like that, <laughs> but we've not ever had any occupants in our three nest boxes. Okay. Um, um, we've tried to work out why. I, I've also got one in my house here, and as soon as we put it up, we've had no occupants. We used to have occupants, and then two or three years elapsed, and I gave up and put a nest box up instead. Anyway, at the church, we do have a peregrine that perches oh. above the nest boxes. Do you think that might be off-putting? <laughs> could just be yeah i think so bill it could just will be a little bit off-putting that yeah yeah, yeah definitely. It, it's not yeah. there all the time but the, and the other thing is we've got a vodafone mast in our um, steeple and i'm okay. wondering if a radio waves or whatever you call it could also be a problem that, that has been a, well, the peregrine, yeah, could be a problem. That that, that could be, because there's not very many things that will catch a swift, you know. Um, but that situation of a peregrine, you know, they are on buildings and things like that. That, that could be difficult, yeah. That could be put, off-putting, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, obviously, if you, I think that could be some, because you're not using a call system at all on the church, are you? No, but we no. were wondering about, that was one of, one of my next questions. To, okay, we'll get to that one in a minute it. then. Let's go back to the Vodafone mast. I've seen on this, you know, I mentioned the Swift Local Network, and that's um, uh, sort of like include, you know, anyone, but then there's local Swift groups can join it and talk about stuff and that. So there was a big conversation once a few years ago about 
Vodafone masts and things like that. And I think, I think the general consensus was that it wouldn't bother them. Right. I think I can certainly, if you wanted to leave your details bill somehow or other, or contact me, you know the Huntley and Districts yep. group anyway. You can you can just Google us and that. Um, if you want to get back to me, I can certainly rec recap that conversation a wee bit and just see if I can find out any more information. But I seem to remember that I don't think it would bother them. I mean, Swifts are quite resilient for things like church bells and things like that. I believe that doesn't bother them at all. Um, right. Also, when we get to the call systems, you know, having a call system speaker inside an S box doesn't seem to bother them either, although I wouldn't really like it. But, um, yeah. but anyway, um, getting to that. So uh, the Vodafone mast, I wouldn't think that's got too much of a worry for them. I wouldn't think so. But by all means, contact me, email me, whatever, and I can recap that for you later. Okay, thank you. Okay. And another sort of follow-up, you would... If there are power lines or telephone lines within about two to three meters below the nest, your hope for nest box, should you for forget putting a nest box up if you have that kind of wire within two or three meters below? <sighs> uh, well, I mean, and maybe Katie knows more about that than I do. I wouldn't have thought. The best thing to do is to is to have a look. I mean, if you wanted to take a couple of photos, Bill, or something, and send them over to me, you can have a little look. But I don't think that would be putting them off. Um, right. You want to, you want a clear drop for them. You don't want anything they can get tangled up in and that. Well, on, the, on the other hand, they're not blind. You know, they can they can fly around things, and can. it's amazing how many things they do fly around and negotiate. It would just be the youngsters, I guess, coming. Yes, it was perhaps getting caught in it. Concerned parents. Think. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have thought it would be too much of a bother. Okay. The best thing to do is to take us, take a photo, take a couple of photos. I think send them over to Katie or myself. Let's have a look and see what the situation is. I think. What do you think, Katie? Yeah, I would answer okay. the same. <laughs> they are very smart. They they get they're very agile and get around a lot of things. But you're right about the babies. They are less um, adapted to be able to do that straight away. So yeah, it would be good to see a picture to see the distance. Yeah, yeah. We'll get them to you. Well, I'm not sure about that peregrine there. I think it's I think you may I think you may just have to accept that you've got the most gorgeous bird in residence. <laughs> <laughs> well, we put up a peregrine's nest first, and then we gave up on the peregrine and went. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a whole ecosystem up there. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Have we any I other could, questions, folks? I, if nobody's got any more, I'll bolt on another question. <laughs> Do you know how well Swifts are doing in Upper Deeside? The Mar Lodge Ranger that used to be there, Peter Holden, left, but his wife put up hundreds and hundreds of nest boxes, just about. That's maybe an exaggeration, but many, many nest boxes all around their farmhouse on National Trust Mar Lodge Estate. And I hardly see any Swifts up in Upper Deeside, but they do you come across them to your knowledge? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um... I'll make some investigations though. So she put up a lot of swift nest boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at least fifty, if not a hundred. Really, really. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that, Bill. I'll be honest with you. I don't. We do have people surveying um, out with, if you like, that sort of our area. You know that sort of thing. But I'm yeah. trying to think if of anyone out that way. Don't think I have. I know of anyone out that way. But I do have connections with some of the rangers. So. If you again, if you if you wouldn't mind just dropping me an email, Bill, or giving yep. us a call or something, give me a little bit of information. I'll try and find out for you. Okay, because there's right. plenty of church steeples up in Bremar as well. Well, there is, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. That's right. We, we can't cover everywhere, can we? <laughs> no, you do very well. <laughs> well, I I honestly think that was such a fascinating evening. So any other last questions because we're 
coming up towards our time at the moment. No? If I could maybe ask if there is, if there are people from Edinburgh here that are connected to a church, um, just to please get in touch with me, um, because I that's where my funding is focused, so I can definitely work with you here. Um, but also, if you've got questions, I can um, answer them further afield. Patricia, <laughs> you've got a question for me? Yeah, how, um, when you say Edinburgh, do you just mean the city centre, or do you mean within the sort of Edinburgh city boundaries? Edinburgh city boundaries. Right, okay. Yeah. I will send you an email. <laughs> Brilliant, I look forward to it. <laughs> I add to that as well, please? I don't know if anyone, apart from... Apart from Bill, who, who may be in um, the Aberdeenshire or Aberdeen area, could get in touch with the Huntley and District Swift Group. I was also going to say that maybe um, maybe we could share, I think we have permission to, from from uh, Danielle's here, from Tayside Swift. I'm sure she won't mind if we forward, you know, if anyone's in those areas, we can send that out in the pack, Katie, for people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, because we basically want everybody, don't we, to, if they, if they have... It, you know connections with the church come on get in touch with your your local swift people let's see what we can do and that's that, if we can do that that's that's fantastic and you be able to lend equipment for the, the speakers for the swifts or is that something that churches would have to buy to use well we lend them out uh, i mean i'm the kind of different to katie and as much as katie has so whatever funding she has for rspb she'll she'll say um w w for the Huntley District Swift Group, we just have to um, apply for various fundings and that. We have got um, some money from uh, one of the uh, the wind farms, of course, and uh, we have got that. So we do have a few. Um, we do lend out occasionally boxes, but we usually try and sell them just for a donation or whatever. But we do have core systems as well that sometimes we lend and sometimes we sell, we sell to people, so depending on the situation. So we can always help out, can't we, Katie? For me in Edinburgh, it's my funding restrictions, but if not, we yeah. can try and source it within the wider Swift community, I think. Brilliant. Well, do you know, it just remains to say thank you to you both. What very talented, very knowledgeable ladies you both are, because it's been a fantastic <laughs> evening, so much information to take in. And we're looking forward to getting all the slides and information back from you as well. Lots for us to take away and have a think about and see if we can just do something to help the Swifts. Absolutely. So thank you both so much tonight. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. It was really you. interesting. Thank, thank, you. You. <laughs> thank you. And thank you everybody for coming along this yeah. evening. Hope to see you again soon. At yeah, one of our thanks. events. Thanks, thank everyone. You.